Welcome back from that analysis segment and back here and uh, we're going to be talking a bit about your team flip side tactics which I've got to say there are a lot of people who don't know exactly what flip side tactics is like what the team is like they think it's just this team that magic its way into the Starcraft scene and it's not a very reliable team but I I actually do know about like some of their involvement in uh, CSGO and everything and you're the team captain of flip side so who better to ask about what exactly flip side tactics is about basically flip side tactics is well they're obviously comprised of a lot of the old clarity members like saravati silky myself and also um, solaris gaming and recently we obviously added puck and actually recently we've um, added lucky as well basically the team is very family oriented like we try to bring the same um, values and morals from clarity gaming to flip side because basically back on when i was on clarity I'm kind of, it was kind of like my job to make sure everyone was happy. That was what I like to do. And if obviously there's problems, um, I sort them out with um, whoever I need to talk to. Uh, what else does the team offer you? Um, team offers me, well, pretty apparel. Holy crap. Flip sides apparel? I, I'm sorry. It looks pretty, I, it looks pretty it's sick. It's so much better than yours. Okay. <laughs> I don't have my jersey. It's coming, but like, it's better than yours you know milkshake yeah. and everything it's better than yours for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did yeah, you just pretty. make that reference we're pretty man oh, i man. i like I, okay i like to make pretty things i like being pretty and i have this pretty pink keyboard <laughs> i have this pretty pink mouse oh my god I have this Oh my gosh, last but not least, we have this pretty pink mouse pad. Wow. Thank you to Zowie Gear for all of that. <laughs> I like being pretty, and Flipside is a pretty team, okay? <laughs> wow, you just you just sold me, man. Where can I pick up some of this gear? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we have a lot of apparel. We have awesome gear sponsors. And yeah, like mm -hmm. a lot of things on the flip side just work out very well. Like the management and Hector and Dana and Finch, very, very wonderful people to work with. Yeah. So talking a bit more about, I guess, the players on the team, then do you feel like you have any rivals uh, either on the team or heck, even outside of the team, actually? Uh, rivalries? Um, obviously, um, I'm one of the two Terrans on the team. The other Terran is um, Nero, a 14 year old Grandmaster. I'm obviously teaching him things that a lot of people actually don't see in StarCraft. Like, there's a lot of things that Koreans don't... Like, when I do watch StarCraft, there's a lot of things Koreans don't do. And I kind of pinpoint those ideas to him. And he understands that, like, this is what you should be doing. And sometimes I come up with um, pretty funky builds. And that's why, like, people think I'm a very cheesy player. Because I just do what I want. And it's mostly from just hanging out on the European server. Because the Europeans are pretty pretty interesting people and you just do funny stuff and that's where i kind of like have my thought process type of thing just make up stupid stuff but um yeah nero is probably my well i wouldn't say he's a rival but more than like a brother pretty much but i want him to be like later down the road when he can play wcs um i want him to be a lot better than me i want him to be just more consistent than me and because yeah i've taught him quite a bit and I'm only going to be teaching him more, right? As, as I grow older, obviously, I become less useful. But as he grows, he's going to get better and he's going to get more um, refined because I teach him a lot of just how to refine your play and everything because I watch a lot of players and the way they use their mouse and keyboard is very inefficient. And I teach him how to kind of refine that. And that's what kind of makes them a rival because I'm teaching him these, these things that I really don't teach anyone else it sounds sort of like a sensei student sort of relationship of trying to teach the student to catch them up to you so that you almost have someone else that you can compete with uh maybe on your team as like a closer person who also has that kind of mechanical uh, stuff that you're talking about could you elaborate on the mechanic stuff that you mentioned um it's basically how if um how you work with the screen well okay this is obviously coming from the koreans because uh, Koreans are very efficient with how they move their screen based on um, mathematical dimensions of like 1920 by 1080. Sometimes they have them smaller, I, I have no clue, but just working with the screen in general and how you look at things and how you, um, how you reach and how you box and all that, I teach Nero a lot of that theory. And um, it just makes it much more efficient for him in the long run because obviously for me, I'm a, I'm a lot older than him by like six years, right? So 
he's going to develop and he's going to grow into it as long as he keeps um, learning how to discipline himself and improve in that state where if I do it myself, um, I'm not going to be as refined as he would be in the future. So I'm pretty much just setting him up for wherever he wants to, whatever he wants to do in StarCraft. It sounds like you really take the whole captain role or almost as a coaching role. It sounds like you're really invested in that, at least with Nero. Do you do this with any other players on flip side? Well, unfortunately, I don't because um, they're obviously a different race. I do put in my opinions here and there. Sometimes they're really stupid because I'm very <laughs> biased as a Terran player. I hate Zerg. I hate Protoss type of thing. But yeah, it's kind of exclusively with Nero. And um, I do this with a lot of stu- uh, like uh, students that ask me for coaching like because I streamed and everything. And they really like how I approach things. Like um, I actually had a student that was very loyal to me when he literally only took coaching from me. And he actually lost his passion, unfortunately, and swapped to League of Legends. Um, but <laughs> he basically came up to me again one day and asked me for a coach. And I'm like, you didn't you quit? And all that. Like, obviously, I'm still really good friends with him. He's an amazing guy to talk. He actually works at Microsoft, so it's pretty chill. But he asked me for, like, mentality coaching, which is something I was like, huh? Why? Because, okay, he saw me on stream one time, just came by just to say hi. And he noticed that I lost to, like, a Blink Stalker all-in, which was really stupid. And he, like, from looking at what how I was playing, I was pretty much playing on point, but I just screwed up somewhere, somehow. Like, I just took it in and made, just said GG, got out, looked at the replay-ish, then um, just moved on. And he really liked how I, dis- I was very disciplined about that. And I guess that's kind of one of the main points about me that... It's kind of different from other players that I'm pretty disciplined when it comes to that stuff. I do rage here um, here and often, and obviously sometimes I just lose it. But I feel like I'm very disciplined when it comes to the game. Just accepting your mistakes is something that a lot of players don't do. And obviously you can apply this to pretty much any game or pretty much anything in life, right? If you make a mistake, and it's going to be your fault. I sometimes try to make it my fault exclusively. Obviously in the end, it's more of a learning experience. Because it's not the end of the world. Like, you're not dead, right? Obviously, there's situations where you could do that and you die. But as long as you're not dead uh, and as long as you're learning and continuing to develop yourself and just get better, um, that's how I kind of approach things. But for StarCraft, it's kind of different for me. I kind of preach it towards people who I teach, but I don't do it for myself because that's obviously what happens. You preach things that you don't do yourself, <laughs> and it's, it's you just um, end up complaining because you don't do it, right? But basically, that is how I try and get my happiness out of just playing the game and being involved in the game, more than trying to make something happen for myself. Because if you can't make yourself happy, you might as well make others happy to make you feel happy in the end. You know, normally I would reserve this question for a little bit later on, but I feel like this is just a really relevant question that I've been dying to ask already, so I'm just going to ask it. Do you see yourself as having a future in StarCraft? Do you want to continue playing competitively, or do you want to take a more of a maxi and be more of a coach? In terms of that, like, I want to be more of a coach more than a player, because I know, like, well, okay, I had kind of had this talk in, back on Clarity. We were given out, like, assignments and stuff like that, because one of um, our manager at the time, Winter, Mike Ortlani, he basically gave us organized pieces of work on how to become a professional in esports. And one of the first things on there that I looked at was when your time comes, what are you going to be doing? Right? I thought about that the first thing. I was like, I am done already. I haven't done anything for myself. Like the last, um, the most significant thing I've done within the past three years or so was qualify for WCS uh, for Canada and won and topped local land. Yeah, that was the first thing that popped into my head. What am I going to do, right? Obviously, I do have my diploma and everything, but that's just something I don't want to be doing because of how stressful school was. Maybe I'll come back to it later in life, but um, as of right now, like I can't really cope with how stressful that life was. But in terms of like StarCraft in general, I don't see myself being in StarCraft for too long anymore because of how um, like how scattered everything is. Like there's not really an, an, inf- an infrastructure for someone to really prosper in it. Um, I'm hoping for the next game, like I would bring that mentality from StarCraft because from StarCraft, I've definitely learned my mentality 
um, in terms of just discipline, uh, blaming myself for losses and things that I should be responsible for and I should know and should know be on, be on top of. Um, I would bring that over to whatever um, field of work I do, whether it's in esports or in real life. And to answer your question about being a coach, um, yeah, I do want to be in coach in StarCraft right now as more more of a coach because I do like making people more happy. Like like I said, making people happy is just probably better than making myself happy because I can't do it. We're going to move on and talk about the Protoss race. How are you feeling about TVP right now? TVP, I will say it's my weakest matchup. There has been days where it's been my strongest, but it is my weakest and it's my weakest mechanically. I don't like the matchup mechanically because... I'm pretty sure it's kind of it's fundamental fundamentals that I'm really screwing up on because um, there was one day where I literally um, had maybe three minute supply blocks. Like I'm one of those Terrans who just gets supply block 24 seven. And with Protoss, it's just it might be because the Marauder costs 100 as opposed to the Marine, which costs 50. But I see Korean Terrans having flawless mechanics in the matchup. And I'm just really confused as to where they're cutting corners because um, with Terran on paper, it's consistent production, consistent production here and there, making buildings, uh, taking expansions and all that. But there's um, like, depending on the style of the Terran, they cut corners where I don't see why you should be cutting those types of corners. And it's kind of mostly in um, making units, but I believe that just having a consistent train of units coming out it's good but obviously the best herons in the world cut those corners to be able to make everything faster and it's kind of why i've cut slightly adjusted and accepted that you do have to do that for the matchup in order to stay um in the game for later on in general for uh, tvp like i feel that i would like to just um play it more methodically but um as i get to the later stages like there's a lot a lot of fear and confusion as to what the pros um should be doing it's not really like the early game where um it's kind of like later in the game where the Paras actually knows how to abuse the Terran race very well because of different factors I really shouldn't mention in this <laughs> <laughs> this thing if anyone's watching. But yeah. If you had to identify one strength and one weakness in the matchup, what would those two things be? Um, it's kind of like the same as my Zerg, actually. My multitasking is probably my best thing about uh, against Protoss and for sure. My macro is horrendous at this matchup. All right. Well, we're going to find out exactly how horrendous your macro could possibly be. I'm just kidding. We're going to find out how your TVP looks as we go into it. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We will be right back. It's game time. Zerg versus Protoss. Hello everyone, welcome to the Terran vs. Protoss. I'm joined here once again by Master Dulk, and we're going to be jumping in in the bottom right-hand corner of the map on top of the red Terran player, representing Team Flipside Tactics and the highlight player of the day. It is Elahame. <laughs> and over on the top right, we have our very doubting Protoss player. He is blue. His name is Clavi. I'd like to say a say la vie because he does it, it does almost spell that but oh alas it may just be clavi so so for those who are wondering why he's asking like you pro blah, blah, blah uh if if you tuned in for the earlier part of the show and saw the Terran versus Terran we mentioned that Elhaim was playing on a barcode account that was in platinum and yes. uh, he's playing against a Masters League <clears throat> Terran player the last game in this Terran versus Protoss he's playing versus a GM Protoss and he's on the Platinum account, so I'm sure, like, when they two hit each other on the ladder, guy is just like, wait a second, wait. Is the MMR system, like, messing up? Is this is this guy actually, like, GM level? Like, what's going on right now? Maybe this is why everyone was complaining about him matchmaking being broken. It's just El Ham was just on his yeah. Platinum account facing GMs, and everyone's Single -handedly, like, this man. isn't fair, guys. Single-handedly. Uh, just not getting the promotion, man. You're literally playing against, like good gm players like in the top of gm and it just doesn't matter doesn't matter man no nope, obviously no this platinum's hacking because you know i'm losing to him <laughs> clearly man that must be the case but 
Got a gas geyser going down for Elohim after the barracks, so nothing nothing super crazy. We're not going to be seeing a CC first, even though I know we've mentioned on the uh, TVZ, I believe, uh, Deadwing, a great map for that kind of stuff. Uh, going to be playing a little bit on the safer side here. Uh, our Protoss player is going to be going up for the two gases, one just a bit more delayed, but that is rather normal. Mm -hmm. uh, actually going to be opting to go for two pro. Oh, never mind. That was a mistake. What? He is gonna oh, be putting in three we're going to see a proxy. Pylon. We're going to see a proxy, maybe. I think, uh, yes, there's only one pylon yes. in the main base. There's the proxy. Yep, our next core is going to be coming down. Um, may also just be like two gate pressure with warping. Uh, but yeah, it could also be a proxy. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Like that. I, you need that second pylon over there if you're yeah. going to go for, like, the proxy, right? And this is such a great location to go for. Well, actually, normally if you'd see a proxy target, you'd have it just down the low ground of the main base just because it's short air distance and low chance it'll get scouted. But look at this. The Reaper's going to oh. scout this out. <laughs> oh, my God. There's a oh, star gate. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is actually going to drop it down. He's, it's actually a smart play that he dropped the second pylon right before that probe died because, I mean, at this point, he is pretty much committed to it. And you know what? The yeah. re single Reaper, it's really not going to be that much DPS to actually kill off the uh, both pylons. So he's going to be able to guarantee the Oracle coming out. He's got an SCV, though. though. You know, that pylon's going to start dying really quick. This Stargate will yeah. be able to finish, of course, though. And most mm -hmm. likely will also be able to get an Oracle. Because, again, as you said, yeah. Reaper, not too much DPS. And SCV isn't supposed to attack things. So the second pylon will be able to give it enough time to live. Mm-hmm. Yep, SCV in the main base as well of Clavi. So Elohim going to be ready to scout out the follow-up to this uh, whenever he so chooses. But Oracle giving Chrono Boosted out the pylon. Actually, a couple more SCVs coming out. Oh, my oh, God. Dol Dolk. Will he actually be able to get this? Oh, my God. A couple I... more Marines are popping out. Also, the Stalker is trying to distract him, but he's not taking nope. the bait. You know, I was about to praise Clavi because he, he got that Oracle started just as the first pylon died. If uh -huh. he didn't, he would have been supply blocked and wouldn't have been able to get that oracle out. But then, you know, he does lose the second pylon. His gate, Stargate's <laughs> unpowered, has to cancel that oracle. Stalker oh isn't going to be able to do too much versus three oh. SCVs, two Marines, and a Reaper. He's supply blocked right now. You're right. He's supply blocked. He's not even starting a pylon right now. Now he is, but... Oh. oh That's man, actually pretty terrible. Is... Uh, yeah, he's, he's Man busy. Gonna go down. Yeah, he's busy trying to micro these stalkers to try and do some damage over here. I mean, he's got to do some kind of damage over here, but yeah, as you're saying, like command center is down. Uh, Elohim is getting ready to transition out. He's looking to be in a beautiful spot. Yeah, SCV of uh, Elohim was actually there it is. in the main base as well, so he saw that there was <coughs> the supply block and most. I believe he saw the. Yeah, he saw the other Stargate yeah, saw the too. Stargate. So. He knows that an oracle's coming. He also knows <laughs> it's really late. So he should be able to defend this fairly easily. Yeah, I mean, this is like the I'm gonna mind game you Stargate Oracle just because it's like, okay, you saw that you shut down the proxy Stargate. So what was the last thing you would expect? That I built another Stargate at home and decided to make the Oracle regardless. But then Elhaim goes in and scouts it out anyways. And you can see he's starting on the missile turret, although I think this missile turret may have been like five seconds too late. Is this Oracle actually going to be able to get in over there and kill off that SCV before it finishes? Uh, no, oh, actually, no, it doesn't no. look like it if the uh, Reaper pulls the Oracle back. No, the Oracle is going to keep on heading back towards Elham's base, and he knows mm -hmm. that's probably his only option right now. He's fallen very behind, but this altar will be able to finish in time. We've also got uh, 10 Marines over here towards Clavis natural and what does he have for defense two stalkers one damage and the mothership core the mothership core uh, Will be able to get photon overcharge in about four seconds too though, so it, It's gonna be cutting it close. Yeah, LAM actually just gonna right click on the uh, Nexus. Yeah, he's gonna end up backing up. I think that's probably a better decision Ooh, Oracle Ooh. getting very far ahead of itself loses a stalker over there as well And could even end up losing an Oracle if he's not careful. Oh. Oh, nice micro over there keeps him alive yeah, and especially having the second one there does allow uh, for Clavi to just pull one back. And I also like that he actually pushed his mushroom core forward a bit to distract the Marines while the <laughs> the target went away. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
three oracles now out so i mean lm does have to be a little bit careful he lost a lot of marines in that pressure and he only has 13 marines actually and these marines they don't have stim or anything finished up stim's still a decent 70 seconds away from finishing up so this could actually cause some trouble there's only those uh missile turrets in the mineral line so there's none protecting any of these add-ons he could actually have stim sniped off if he's not careful yeah he's got a marauder here and that's not gonna be able to do too much since it can't shoot up not gonna be going for the add-ons and the marines are gonna arrive up top two of these oh! missiles were already damaged and it's gonna be losing a third one as you know well <laughs> you gotta move yeah <laughs> you can't just sit in one spot and then stay alive yeah not the best control over there from our uh, gm protoss player right now but We'll see if he can recover this game. I mean, he is, again, feeling fair, fairly far behind, especially since Elohim is taking a third, and really, what is there to stop him? There's not any chance of Protoss aggression starting up. If you take a look, those oracles, that oracle production, really has cost Clavi quite a bit. He's got a Stargate, and sure, he's got like a robotic space finish up, but he's got one gateway, one gateway, Dalk. Yep, just the one, uh, and producing units off of one warp gate isn't very good even just taking a look at the army supply it's a six difference right now and that's mainly because oh hey he's just producing all of his tech all of his command centers everything that isn't an army because he knows he doesn't have to right now mm -hmm. yep unfortunately oh getting a little bit supply blocked over here we're gonna be finishing up some of the supply depots and freeing up quite a bit of supply but here comes in the drop, and I like the fact that Clavi is saying, you know what, as long as I can't spend my money on gateway units, might as well make a Phoenix from this uh, Stargate train transition now, and maybe help deal with some of those drops a little bit better. But is he actually going to even have enough to deal with a double medevac drop? I mean, he's got a Colossus and some gateway units out, but it's not a lot. Yep, and that drop's going to be coming in right now. The, there's actually two gateways finished, but they weren't turned into warp gates until just now. Phone and Overcharge is going to go down. Going to unpower the two new gateways. <laughs> going to unpower the Stargate. There's only one Phoenix here, a Colossus, a Stalker, an Immortal. You know, whereas Elham, he's just going to pick up. He's going to boost away as he he dealt enough damage. He also got rid of that Stargate. So, exactly. very well done. I mean, yeah, he didn't really need to do any more damage than that. The two warp gates are still, again, delayed. And you can see that Clavi's money is starting to build up. He was expecting those gateways to have finished up by now. He was expecting to be able to start warping stuff in. He's supply blocked, it looks like, or uh, is going to be supply blocked very soon. Managed to get those pylons finished up. But again, Elohim, you want to I want to note, third expansion has been there. And this is the first sighting that Clavi's had of that third. Yeah, and that's probably not making him too comfortable right now, as he knows he's even more behind than he already was. And just that single Phoenix is not going to be enough. You you can use it to scout medevac, sure, but on a map like Deadwing, where there's not too much just open air space, it'll be very easily that, oh, I drop down four Marines, and then target fire that Phoenix, and it's going to die. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful with it as to how you use it. Yep. Uh, Medivac's gonna be loading in the main base. Uh, they're unloading right next to Colossus and some Stalkers. It looks like a queued up command over there from Elham. Elham at the same time looking for the third. He stims up to potential like fourth location. He's like, where, where is your third? I, I don't understand, man. Yeah. Uh, there, the reality is there is no third. There's not even a hidden third expansion. Yeah. And you know he he now knows oh i'm economically ahead not only that but he's also upgrades ahead i don't know if he was able to click on those stalkers on the colossus when he dropped into the main but if he did he would have seen that they were still on zero zero where he's got two two gonna be finishing up very soon and knowing all of this he should be feeling very comfortable right now and it looks like you know his production is starting to ramp up quite a bit we've also got four vikings coming out at a time as well so those colossus they're not going to be too useful very soon yeah, the double reactor starport production that you can really kick into gear with when you have those three bases mining. Elham going to just be looking to be in a better and better position as the game goes on. And But frankly, the pros player needs to figure out something that he's going to do about this. Because as you were saying, behind on upgrades, behind on just economy, behind on everything right now. He's got a decent number of Colossus though, and with all these warp gates finishing up, I have to think that Clavi is just going to try and get up maybe some Archons or Storm and go for a big push out, but Elohim gonna be the one that continues the aggression until then. Yeah. And right now, Elohim, he's got quite a bit of a force, even got two SCVs, one of them even has a Vespian gas canister. That's how confident he is with this army. 
charge is about to finish it up though, so that's going to be able to kick in while the Zealots are very close. But fourth field's actually not going to work too well for Klebi here, as Elham already <laughs> had his army behind all of them. Vikings yeah. are going to be trying to look for these Colossi to fight, but Zealots, they're getting warped in, but dying as they're getting warped in. The Immortals trying to do whatever they can, but the Marauders, you know, there's quite a few of them here in this army. Yeah, I mean, Clavi doing an okay job. I mean, the building positioning working out kind of okay, making it difficult for that army to push on in, and even the Vikings kind of landed because there were two Colossusing in the main base. So then half the Vikings end up dying over there by the time the Colossus get there. But still, at the end of the day, LM just has so many units and he's still got a decent number of Marauders left over. He could even just elevate her up into the main base and start picking off the pylons. Yeah, and right now, El Ham, he's actually double the supply of his opponent, <laughs> or well, very close to double the supply. And six Templar are gonna get warped in. Is Storm Storm is not even researched. Like they're they're here just for feedbacks, and that's not even gonna be able to do too much. Gonna try warping into Archons. The Archons take a while, and he's gonna have to tap out. Yep. In our Platinum League, I, I mean, Elaheim from Flipside Tactics gonna be taking that game. A very very cool game. Just constant aggression. Honestly, it came down to that hold for the Stargate. Everything else afterwards is kind of yeah. icing on the cake, but. Elaheim just got really far ahead when he shut down that Stargate with a really, really smart decision just to pull a couple more SCVs because he realized if I kill off the pylons before they actually finish up, there, my opponent is unbelievably far behind because I've already expanded. Yeah. Um, but and with that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Elaheim, he's also not the type to just kind of not scout. So, mm -hmm. like, that Reaper going there was something he was set on doing yeah. for a while, so... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like they might chalk it up to just it being ladder, might chalk it up to it being like a platinum barcode. <laughs> Actually, it probably is just that it's a platinum barcode. <laughs> you don't think that they're going to think about that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. So, with that being said, I'm going to jump into the analysis section with LMA and Joker anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back. Hope you guys enjoyed that Terran vs. Protoss as much as I did. I'm back here with Elaheim, and we're going to be going over the analysis of this game that you sent in. So break it down for us, man. What happened? So basically this game, obviously, in TVP, you want to be scouting relatively early in order mm -hmm. to find out how many pylons, how many gases your opponent is taking in order to identify whether he's trying to all in you or take an expansion. It's pretty basic 101 of TVP as of, right now, um, as of, in, as in Heart of the Swarm. Um, so here, um, with my vision, if we see in his base, I only see one pylon. Um, I could have um, scouted a little south, uh, a little more south, but I this guy in particular, Clavi, is very cheesy. So um, I <laughs> automatically assume that he is doing some sort of proxy, whichever it is, whether it's um, Oracle, Blink, whatever, right? <laughs> um, so in my as a response to this, um, Terran has to. Um, First of all, in, um, in base expand, that's the first thing you do. Uh, mm -hmm. Second of all, you have to bl build a blind engineering bay because um, even if it's blink, proxy blink, bro proxy robo, you have to consider that um, it's Oracle as well. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a big fault for Terran as of right now that you have to build an engineering bay when Zerks can build an evolution chamber. Well, don't have to build an evolution chamber in order to get a spore crawler. Um, because a engineering bay actually costs pretty much a barracks, so um, I hope Blizzard just give me the removal <laughs> of the engineering bay requirement for a turret. The then. Void. So I'll be happy. I mean, a lot of players have complained about this too. Like, um, yeah, the the engineering bay practically costs a barracks. So yeah, I'd like to have the extra barracks instead of just hoping to God that it's actually a um, Oracle play, and in this case it was. So, as a response to seeing only one pylon, um, you kind of have to look around in certain places, um, especially on this map. Um, one of the most key places to look for is kind of this general area. Um, that's where you'd usually hide a Stargate, because if your opponent scouted cross first, he can just go, um, he can just sit there and not, um, not ever scout you, because, um, your opponent didn't scout you, and they could just build a Stargate there, and mm -hmm. the Terran will never know. So that's why you kind of have to scout there first. Second place is over here, and sort of over here as well. These are more, these are like less common because of the scouting pattern, but mm -hmm. it's still possible. You just have to account for everything, and you just have to prepare optimally. Um, 
So here, my Reaper actually intercepts this, and I'm like, okay. So I see the Stargate is actually here, and I'm like, okay, this might be doable in terms of like preventing the Oracle com from coming out. And um, what I mean by that is pulling SCVs and having units there in position, just ready to be able to um, shut uh, shut down these pylons in order to prevent the Oracle from coming out. Um, another cute thing that I also did is if you look in my opponent's main, I actually kept the SCV here just to make yeah. sure um, I know what my opponent is doing afterwards. So here, obviously, the Oracle's trying to come out. I actually pulled some SCVs here. Normally, you wouldn't really do that because if, um, if let's say, the Oracle, the well, Stargate is all the way here, you're not going to pull them all the way there just to right. make it, um, yeah, right? But um, in this case, I... I did because it was relatively close, and I actually kind of skimped on the turret as well. Normally, um, if it was farther away and I knew that um, my opponent would be able to make the Oracle, I would obviously make the turret. But in this case, I saw that um, it wasn't possible for it to finish because I had two Marines coming up, I have a couple SCVs and the Reaper shooting at it, and I was like, okay, if this is not coming out. So I was very confident in terms of holding it. And as you can see, the Oracle just doesn't come out. He actually has a Stalker coming in, and he actually can't fight this alone. So it's yeah. totally good. And I also noticed um, you've got like a really fast Pulse 1 weapons. What, what was this? Is that just like, oh man, I've got this kind of thing? Or was it something else behind that? Um, so normally, um, well, normally what I wanted to do this game actually was go Factory. Mm -hmm. And because that these types of builds exist in the metagame right now, Mm -hmm. um you you there's no real place for you to spend all your gas right so i was just like yeah let's just get this because i was planning to spend it on factory anyway might mm -hmm. as well just get the plus one but normally if you were um like there there is an actual build that flash actually made where he just goes cc uh, like um reaper expand cc uh reactor and then he actually just gets an ebay just because like he just he wants that plus one and it kind of panned out into this um because of me seeing the oracle normally um if there was no oracle if my or if my opponent went for an expansion play i would just throw it on a factory um and this is kind of the reason why i don't think factory builds in this match are very good because there's different um there's different types of cheeses that Protoss can do in order to pretty much counteract what the terran does with the factory because it does it just doesn't come um like a widow mine doesn't really guarantee a safe play against the oracle because um if your opponent can micro then obviously it's not you this just doesn't um work out for you right yeah and if you try to widow mine drop um as a response and play a little aggressive with it um your opponent can still just shut it down because revel um it's not revelation what Whatever the yeah. observer thing is for the oracle Invision, is, I don't oh, yeah, know. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's why I try and stray away from factory play nowadays. I used to do it a lot because obviously everyone calls me a cheeser. <laughs> but um, yeah, I try to stay more safe in this matchup because there's so many things that Protoss can do nowadays. And um, there's something that Xenosider said where he... It was a quote to like Avalo where he doesn't understand how the flow of the matchup works. And he's saying that like Terran has to play nowadays a very specific way in order to get to the mid game. And that's kind of what this is. Because mm -hmm. um, like the fact that we don't we have to build an eBay just to make a turret is kind of one of the bigger reasons as to why um why we have to play this way. And because we invest that 125 minerals, we can't really invest into another um barracks because mm -hmm. if you make a turret and halt it at 99 percent, which is what flash actually does and there's no like t uh oracle or maybe even a dt he just cancels it and just um uses it for whatever else and that's okay but having to complete the um, the engineering bay and make a turret is pretty silly in my opinion so yeah th this is how terran should be um, reacting nowadays in order to prevent these ch this type of cheese but mm -hmm. the good thing about it is um because my opponent did this type of cheese um their expansion is very del delayed and also their tech so um getting into the mid game obviously is very easy for me and um i can pretty much just do whatever i want to do 
Yeah, so what I'm points. getting is, David Kim, please make turrets, you know, 200 minerals? <laughs> yeah, each, dude. Uh, but <laughs> remove the engineering bay cost. No, man. <laughs> I need my barracks, please. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Elham. We're going to be going back to the interview segment. Uh, don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back.